Okay, I'm very pleased to welcome Alan Davenport as our presenter today. Alan Davenport is the ELT consultant for the Asian region at Cambridge University Press. He's been actively involved in education for more than 15 years as a teacher, teacher trainer, administrator and examiner. Alan holds a bachelor's degree in linguistics and a master's of education with a focus on student development. This is the third webinar in his series of sessions on using authentic practice tests in the IELTS classroom. So, over to you, Alan. Thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, for once again giving your time today. Um, it's a very warm, balmy 30 degrees outside in Bangkok, so I feel a little guilty seeing people say hello from snowy Moscow and and, and other places, uh, but uh, thank you very, very much for attending, regardless of what the weather is like and, and where you're at around the world. So I think we should just get started and, and jump right in as I like to do. And as was just mentioned, you know, this is the third in a four part series. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time re rehashing some of the things that I've done in part one and part two. Um, but th those are available to, to view um, if you would like to see them. The first one was on reading uh, skills and the second one on writing. And of course, this one focusing on listening. And just kind of a summary, though, of what kind of guides the theme of these webinars is, is kind of my uh, philosophy of, of what I found that worked using authentic practice tests in the IELTS classroom. I found that when I was teaching IELTS that there was somewhat of a, a disconnect sometimes, I think, between what the teachers in my school um, thought that they were, what, what their purpose was in teaching a test preparation course and what the students themselves were kind of expecting out of a test preparation course. and you know, through trial and error and, and, and looking at what worked and what didn't work in the, in the classroom to really meet the students' expectations and to improve results, I think I found this sort of magic formula, not that it's really magic, it's somewhat basic, um, that in order to prepare our students for an IELTS exam, it does take, you know, a good course book and of course, a good test preparation class will include experience taking the test, you know, authentic practice test testing. But what I found kind of missing as I was observing teachers in their classrooms as they were doing these sorts of activities was using the authentic practice tests as more than just testing. For example, in the context of listening, I knew that a lot of teachers would you know, do the listening activities from the book, and then they, they may, you know, set a, a whole listening test for the students to do once a month and, and check the answers. But it wasn't really incorporating the authentic practice tests into the classroom and into the pedagogy. And I realized that this was an important and crucial key because of what I think that test preparation classes should be doing. And that's mainly, you know, it, it's not that we're to give them tips and tricks and, and magic techniques to help them score higher on a test than they can do. But the purpose, I think, of a good test prep class, whether it's IELTS or CAT or PET or anything, is to make sure that the score that the students receive reflect their actual level of English. And I think listening is a curious skill. And I think uh, this quote from McCarter really, really sums it up the best of what happens with listening, that even fairly advanced students can underperform quite considerably by as much as one band score, if not more, in the listening component. And that idea of underperformance is something that really worries me when, when a, a student who should have gotten a, a, a 6.5 or a 7 on the listening band you know, gets a band score lower. And it's, it's, it's not that they didn't know the tricks or techniques or that they were trying to get a score higher than what they could have, but the score just didn't reflect, you know, what the true student's 
ability might be. And it's not a fault of the test. And it's not a fault of the student, but I think that something happens, especially with listening in the test preparation process. And without blaming too much, I think that this, this quote from McCarter sums up what I saw in my classrooms. Teachers may possibly be under delivering and so contributing to this underperformance. So what I really want to address today is, is how can we use authentic practice tests to make sure that we're delivering good listening instruction to our students? And why underperforming? Why might that happen? It's because listening competence on these tests requires more than just understanding how the listening test works. Now, it is important that students know the basics about a test. It is important that they know that on the IELTS that all the, the questions will be in order and that there will be 40 questions across four sections. It's important about that. But I think what we really, what we really want to make sure that we do is that when we're bringing in listening to our classrooms, that we're teaching the skill of listening even as it applies to testing, instead of just continually testing listening. And by the way, this is not limited just to IELTS classes. I see some of the same things in general English classes uh, when I used to observe them of, of, you know, thinking that even I myself as a teacher was teaching a listening lesson when really I was testing listening. And I think that the standard Kind of routine that I got stuck in when I was using a course book kind of looked like this, where the teacher played the audio and you know we did a tape script three point two would come on, and we would we would all listen and then the 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 students would listen and write the answers, and then we would check the answers and then we would look at how many were correct or incorrect, and then we might listen again so that we could hear the correct answers and then turn the page. And to me, this is more of a testing approach than a teaching approach. And it has its moments. There are times when we want to do this in class, but I think that there are ways that we can teach listening or expand this process to make sure that, that listeners can be more clued in to the skills required for the task that they need. So task for you then, and this comes from the CELTA course uh, book, um, and it's just a, a different way to think of stages of a listening task. And you can see that there are six different stages here, but they're out of order. And what I would like for you to do is just have a look. I'll give you about three minutes for this task. Have a look, and then in the chat box, what order do you think might be more logical to use these six uh, stages in? In other words, which would be first, which would be second, which would be third? And I'll give you about three minutes to do that now. So if you can have a look and put your answers in the chat box. seeing the answers coming in, a lot of very similar 
answers, which is fantastic. Keep keep them coming in. And I'll give people about 20 more seconds if they want to, to still give some, some ideas. There's, no, there's not one correct right answer here, so, so don't worry, don't be shy. Right, well, let's look at the suggested answer from the CELTA book. And they think that appropriate order might be D, the teacher generates interest in the topic, you know, what we know about activating schema, getting them interest, getting them want to, to, to listen, followed by E, presenting some key vocabulary to make it comprehensible, um, you know, to make sure that they can understand what they're hearing. And then F, setting a gist task, you know, talk, who is talking, how many people are talking, and, and playing a short section to get them kind of tuned in, I think, as some people like to say. And then B, the teacher setting a task that requires listening for specific details, going in and, and, and you know, the, the task that's in most course books, the, the filling in the blank, the multiple choice, and going on and and providing support there. And then, interestingly enough, bringing in the transcript of the reading so that we can read and listen at the same time. And that's something that I know in the language school that I, I monitored and was, was kind of uh, a director of that, you know, kind of got lost, you know, where, where the tape scripts were being used or not used in regard to listening tasks. And then the teacher focusing on features of grammar or vocabulary. So that's that's uh, you know the the kind of the way that we can transition from just teach or sorry testing listening into something more along the lines of teaching listening of encouraging our students to see listening as a skill. So this is this is uh, those in order again. And when I was teaching IELTS, I found this very very effective. When I was using the course book, um, you know, the, the course book is full of, of great activities that, that are, are designed to, to be scaffolded, to, to encourage our learners not just to take the test, but to develop their language ability. And I think that that worked great for doing those activities with the course book. I think that when it came to authentic practice tests, though, there was something that I kind of came across that worked even better than that for me. And that's what I'd really like to share with you guys today. Now, again, when I say authentic practice tests, I, I need to make it clear. You know, I'm, I'm talking about the, the books that are the, the just like the real tests that the learners will take. I think, you know, when it comes to IELTS, you know, the books that we have from Cambridge, IELTS 8, 9, 10, 11, those sorts of things that you're used to, um, that give that sense of realness to the test. And we can use them as more than just testing. Now, there are times that I think that we do want to periodically use those authentic practice tests 
as tests to monitor how the learners are doing to see if they can handle the, the authentic testing situation. And I think some of the things that we can take from that CELTA style listening approach is to make sure that even in that mode, when we're doing a, a, a testing mode, that we're bringing in the audio scripts, that it's that they're being used in a more purposeful way. And also, when we're doing that testing mode, we're taking the time after the testing has been done to go back and analyze the language, giving the students time to ask us questions, not just about what the right or wrong answer is, but about something else that they've read or heard in the tape script or something that they want to volunteer to, to suggest that the class listen again because they were confused. And also guiding them to what they can be doing during the, those first 30 seconds or so when they have to preview the, the listening questions. You know, I think that I've seen a lot of my students when they say, you know, you now have time to look at questions one to eight. There's a mad dash of circling and underlining in a frenzy that goes on. And I'm not sure if some of my students were actually consciously aware of what they were circling or underlining. It was just a furious mm -hmm. race to make sure that they got as many lines and circles before the listening started. And so I think that that's kind of the issue that we can take care of when we're giving things in test mode, being more direct about what happens before and after the testing. What I really want to focus on is this idea of a practice mode. And what I found was a technique that allowed the learners in my classrooms to hear the listening in a purposeful way and to hear it five times, which I think really supports learners not only in language development, but also in being able to understand the nuances of a test like the IELTS. But overall, they would wind up listening to the recording very purposefully five times and each time with a different purpose. And I think that when we bring in authentic practice tests, this is an approach that worked wonders for me. And so that's why I'm excited to share it with, with you all today. So in our first play with authentic practice test, we're actually not going to pre-teach language and we're not going to set up the scene. We're just going to give them the test section and we're going to play it one time. Now, I say test section because in practice mode, I don't want to give all four parts. I may not even give, you know, all the question sets in one part. I might just give, let's say, questions 7 to 12 and focus on that part of the listening. So during the first play, they, they attempt that test section. And here's an example of what I mean. So. Here's questions 11 to 20. And what I would want to do is I would want to make sure that the test section that I was pulling from fit the theme of the teaching somehow, some way. It might be either by, you know, we've just studied in the course book of a certain question type that's on the aisle, so I might want to focus on something authentic that uses that question type. Or even better, what IELTS course books are, are really good at is providing a context for us to, to get the test practice in. And so look at this section two and look at, you know, it has the comments and the collections. Is there a theme that kind of jumps out to you, kind of a context that we would find in a course book that this would work with. And if you think you see that theme of, of, what, of, of what topic this pertains to, go ahead and type it into the chat box for me. Absolutely, Monica, I see you're the, the first one there. Art, 
you know, arts and paintings and exhibitions and museums and all of that, perhaps even history because 20th and 21st century, 19th, exactly. So I'm not going to just tie this into one possible context, but I'm going to look and say, if I have, you know, that, that theme and we're talking about art or museums or history, I may be able to do this listening process, you know, it, with these authentic practice tests in this practice mode with the students. So I've had them listen the first time to this, and I've had them try to answer. There's something to keep in mind. I am a, a huge fan of students having their own practice test book. I, I think that students should have a course book and they should have the, the same authentic practice test book in their classroom. And to me, it didn't matter if it was IELTS 9, IELTS 10, it didn't always have to be the, 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 the newest one, although it's great if you can get it. But I wanted them to have the same authentic practice test book in the classroom because we could do these little snippets together. And then when I had them do something in what I call this practice mode, making sure that I print out an answer sheet for them to write on so that they don't actually write these in the test book themselves. And then that way, maybe a month or three weeks later, when I give the whole test, they can use their book to write in. So it's something really, really good about having the answer sheet there and tell them, don't write it you know, for practice mode. We're going to save that for the test. And it also reinforces to the students that this is a practice mode, that this isn't the testing, that this is something you know, for them to get better at, that they're improving their skill, not just proving whether they have the skill or not. So they attempt the first section, and then we're going to listen a second time. And the second time, now I'm going to have them check their understanding and I'm going to let them check it in pairs because what I really wanted to do was try to make this more collaborative. You know, if you're in an IELTS class and you do listening repeatedly, it can get kind of it can get kind of well dull, quite frankly, because we're just all listening to a CD. So after the second play, then learners can check their understanding in pairs and they can talk about where there is disagreement and where there is an agreement and they can you know if, if they disagree they they talk and and then they know okay we're going to listen the third time and we're going to see who's right and who's wrong and at this point it's crucial still that the teacher gives no comment then we listen a third time and this to me was the most fun because this is when you get to see the learners kind of look at each other and 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 you know tap each other and say see i told you and oh and oh we were both wrong and and that sort of thing um but the pairs then check to see who is right and then we can elicit uh from our learners what they think the answers are um in pairs what did you get for three four five and at this time, the teacher can summarize, but does not say what answer is correct or not yet. That's crucial. So that, you know, maybe the teacher, it will sound something in the class like, okay, I see three groups have said that they think the answer is 15 pounds. One group said the answer was 50 pounds. And I'm just kind of sharing with the class what the options are and what, what they've said as a whole. And then you've guessed it. We listen a fourth time. And now we can check to see who is right. And now the teacher can give the comments about, you know, you need to be careful, especially on the IELTS between words like 30 and 13 or 50 or 15. And the teacher can can give the comments about, you know, where the class was really divided and what they what they heard you know letting students get a chance to see as a class what their strengths and their weaknesses are and encourage reflection in this way and again you know this is where we can give the correct answers and then the fifth time is where the class can listen with the audio script and the teacher answers any questions that they have about what they heard in the listening and that i think is is a great way 
they get exposure to the listing five times each one purposefully. And I have to give credit where credit is due. I adapted this from a, 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 the non-interventionist format for list, a listening lesson from John Field. And for those of you who like methodology or who, who are interested in listening or want a book on listening, this book, Listening in the Language Classroom, is superb. I mean, John Field is my go-to guy for listening. So just adapting this, it became non-interventionist. And Crucial for me because I wanted the practice mode not to be just full and, you know, deep in sink or swim, but I also didn't want it just to be the standard routine of how we did the listening with the course book CELTA style. So this is really something that I found when I brought in those snippets from the practice tests that uh, was a different way to do it. It was more purposeful and it, it frankly it just it just worked better another thing that i'll point out with our authentic practice test that is, that is really handy is um you know with cambridge it actually underlines where the answers are and i think this was a big eye opener to students and if nothing else when you're using authentic practice tests in the classroom i mean this is something that i think gets skipped in listening the audio scripts are there to encourage and support learners and so any time that we can bring them in and use them and exploit them in any teaching context, it's, it, it, you know, it helps just that whole skill of listening. Another thing that I'm really, really excited about is Test Bank. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Test Bank, but this is a screenshot from it. I, I, aware that our students who are going to come in, especially at a private language school, don't always give themselves the appropriate amount of time to prepare for the IELTS test. Maybe your students were different than mine, but you know, sometimes they would come in to, to my uh, school and say, oh, I need to take the IELTS test. I need a 6.5. And I'd ask, oh, really? When are you going to take the test? Oh, next week. And I, oh, oh my goodness, you know. So that's, that's something. This test bank is housed on our learning management system. And we have on this, this program called Test Bank, these authentic practice tests loaded up. And what it is, is it's basically the, the same type of content that are in the books are here, but it can be done in an asynchronous environment. It can give chances for learners to do practice tests at home in both a test mode or a practice mode. And this is, I think, crucial. And you see the little locks there. That's because if you have a class and you're a teacher, you can actually control when students have access to the practice tests in practice mode or test mode. And, and these sorts of things. And it just, you know, it lets you be able to monitor the students. It lets you be able to, to drill down and see, but it also lets them do it outside of class in, in more of a controlled environment. It definitely could be used for self-study, but my whole mantra, my whole reason for doing these webinars is, is to try to say to, to, to you guys, uh, teachers, authentic practice testing have places in the classroom besides just as a test. And I think Test Bank really demonstrates this. This is what they see, for example, the listening part. And it's, it's very much what they see for computer-based IELTS test. You know, like I said, authenticity is key, and these are authentic. And I don't know about the rest of the world, but in Thailand, computer-based IELTS testing is, is started here, and there are more and more students taking the test by that method. So that's something that, you know, we need to consider that, that we need to provide these, these ideas or these, this practice mode for our students, depending on what type of test they're going to take. What I like about practice mode, yes, we can't do, you know, the listening in five times in pairs if they're doing it at home alone, but it's still a practice mode in that it contains hints if the students need it, especially like this one, listen carefully for numbers that sound familiar. Just remind, you know, things to key in and clue on. 
So again, it's it's showing the learners that they're improving their skills and not just testing, testing, testing their skills. And of course, they can see the audio script as well. So you can see they've they've this this student has hit in 150, which was which was incorrect, and they can look at the tape script from what they've listened to and see that it's 150 and listen to it again. So it's not just a practice test that says you got 37 out of 40, congratulations. It allows students to reflect and improve on their listening skills. And again, I think the link is the link is in the chat box. I don't want to belabor the point too much, but Test Bank is part of this practice makes perfect thing. Um, it, it's very much similar to the the books that we make of authentic practice tests and that there's four tests per exam. It replicates what the students are really going to see, and it's managed on the CLMS, our, our Cambridge Learning Management System, which means you as a teacher, if you adopt Test Bank, you actually get a chance to look at student process or start student progress, their answers, um, and it, it lets us do it, like I said, have a practice mode that's authentic outside of the classroom, because listening takes time. I will say that Test Bank is not just about listening. All four skills are there. And um, we, with some of our more popular uh, IELTS materials, there's now an option to buy them with a code that which Test Bank comes with. You know, things like common mistakes for IELTS and complete and new insight into IELTS. Um, it's just something to check out. So, I mean, I would encourage you to follow the link to test bank and find out more about it and see if this is something that could help you help your students in your class. So that's kind of the general idea of what I wanted to do. I know that, that some of you are, are here because um, you know you like some of the techniques that I can give. So I want to share with you just three specific techniques that I also found very, very useful when I was teaching IELTS. Um, as you'll see, when I say techniques, some of these involve strategies, some of these involve knowing about the test. And here were my top three. These were the things that I did in an IELTS classroom that I think really helped my learners sometimes. And I want to start with my favorite one of that I call ordering the text. And I think this is great for listening part four on the IELTS, the long lecture. Um, for a lot of our students whose language is not at a high level, this can be an excruciating task. Um, and I, I see many times a lot of the problems that, that students have is not wanting to move on with the tapes or with the audio script as, as it's going on. They get stuck on a question you know there the the tape keeps on talking and talking and talking but they're still at question number 32 expecting the the answer to magically appear or there's been a long gap between uh when the question 32 and question 33 appeared and they start to get worried that they've missed something and you know there's a lot of stress that comes on to listening part four i don't know if your students are the same in in uh, the part of the world that you're at, and I'd, I'd love to, to hear about it in the chat box if they are. But, you know, for me, uh, yeah, it was frustrating to see. So what I wanted to do was develop an activity that, that showed them the parts of listening part four that were actually there to help them and to give them anchors and structures and to, to remember that, you know, a successful test taking skill was moving down the page and to be aware of the signposts and the anchors that the tests give them. So here's an example of, you know, a, a typical listening part four. And what I would do is I would actually take this page and I would, you know, reduplicate either through Microsoft Word or, or make a photocopy of it. And what I would do is I would remove the question numbers because the questions go in order, so we want to make sure that they don't have that kind of clue to go into it. And then I would cut each of the lines into strips. So, for example, here I've got, first of all, the headings, Ratan Lao, Soil and Carbon, California Study, Australia Study. 
So what I do is I would put students in maybe groups of three or four, and I would just give them these headings as strips, and we'd listen one time, and then I would just want them to put those in order as they were talking about it. So again, using the authentic practice test and, and making an order task out of this. And then I would listen again, and maybe we could take those smaller strips I would give each group and, and have them try to manipulate and figure out which order this was in. Because, for example, on this page, this claims that 13% of CO2 in the atmosphere could be absorbed by agricultural soils. I found that, how, how can I put this? I found that a lot of my students would not even read that because there wasn't a blank on it, so they didn't feel that it was important. When really, this is there to make sure that students are anchored and they know where they should be at the test. It's something designed at the test to help them keep their place that students weren't focused on and were ignoring. And so by having them do this, they could see how these parts of the test that didn't have blanks were there to help them and anchor them. And so I think that that's a way to really get them to focus and understand how the test works and how you know all the different parts of there are there for a reason. So ordering the text. And also it's great because it's tactile, you know, they're moving strips of paper around on the desk, which is great. And um, they can work in groups together. You'll see one student move something somewhere and another student grab it and think there. And, and it's, it's, it's something I think really nice. So that's the idea. And then after that, we could take the strips away and have them listen and perform the task. So next, I would say reverse key words. And reverse key words is something that if you saw my reading webinar is, is um, that I'm big on. But you know, having students identify the key words that they're listening for is important for a listening test. But a lot of times my students, they thought that every word was a key word or they weren't really focused on what the key words were. So just making sure that after we listen and we bring in the audio script and we see the answer, then we can go back and look at the questions again and say, what were really the key words in the, the questions and answers that were there to help us? And what were the distractors? And having them refocus and evaluate how they were at predicting what the key words were. And finally, a another thing that I loved, especially with, with our lower level IELTS students, they, they really got a kick out of this, are what I call distractor dialogues. And I think uh, we IELTS teachers are really familiar with how distractors work, especially in part one of the listening. Here's an example, you know, there are but only 15 pounds, the 12 pound seats have all been sold, or like what Rob says in the next line. Yes, that's right, the secondary school, make sure you don't go to the primary school. And they'll give more of these, these uh, answers than what's really required for the, the, the blank. For example, what music or what instrument does she play? Doesn't she play the oboe or flute or something? Yes, the flute. And so giving students chances to understand that these distractors are in there and also giving students the chance to make their own. And I think that um, having them do these distractor dialogues was a fun way to get students to understand what the test was doing. I would have students in pairs write their own answers full of distract a question and answer and have them act it out in front of the class and then have the class guess with what the real answer was that they were trying to say. And this is, again, it's, it's about the listening test skill of identifying distractors, but it became communicative. It became, you know, collaborative. Um, my, my students never got this complex, but it gets you kind of an idea of, of what, you know, I would give to them as an example in the class, you know, what day did you go shopping? And then another student would read, I thought I would go on Tuesday, but it rained, so I made a plan to go on Wednesday, but my friend called and said she will go on Thursday, but I decided not to go with her and stick to my original plan. 
and student A says I see, and then the class tries to analyze what day, you know, that the student actually went shopping, and in this case, it being Tuesday. And this isn't exactly authentic, and again, they don't get this complex, but they get the idea of, of what happens in the listening of, you know, aren't you going to the, the theater tomorrow? Well, I was going to go tomorrow, but I changed my mind and I'm going on Saturday instead. So that's, that's kind of the, the idea between this one here with the distractor dialogues. It's something the students can produce. It's something I think that really, yeah, it's, it's fun, it's tricky, and it points out an important skill to have for the listening test. So just a few more points. Do make sure that students get chances to ask questions on what they did and didn't get correct. I, I, I know that in listening classes, you know, it takes a lot of time to do it. It takes a lot of time to check. But if we can't give them the time to follow up and really reflect, especially with the tape script, then we can fall in to that idea of testing instead of teaching listening. And by the way, this works great with Test Bank, where you can drill in and you can see how your students did. You know, you, you as a teacher get a score report as well for your test, and you can really talk about, you know, what was difficult, what questions did they miss the most, what questions did they get right for successes, and, and kind of triage their needs. Um, if you're doing the written testing, like using the books, make sure that the students have practiced transferring answers to the answer sheet. You know, on the IELTS test, they'll have 10 minutes to do that, and I have I have invigilated exams where I have seen students just sit there, not even though that people are writing right next to them and, and something's happening. And then they kind of look around and they get the idea, oh, I'm supposed to be doing something and they don't get all the answers copying. So I also want to say that, um, again, this is my whole point. Use practice tests as more than just progress testing. You know, these ideas, especially with listening, these grammar structures that we're teaching, these themes and contexts like art museum, discourse, these can all be explored by exploiting what goes on in these, these authentic practice tests. Make sure that students understand that good exam practice involves both that test mode, taking the test under the exam conditions, where you give them the 45 minutes to do all 40 questions, but also that they understand the need and that it's okay to do it in practice mode, that it's okay to take the time and listen two or three times as practice to build up their skills with it. And like I mentioned before, as much as you can, if you're bringing in authentic practice tests, don't feel that you have to bring in the whole test. If there's one section that really matches the theme of the course book or whatever unit you're doing, it is completely okay to bring in just that short section and give them the practice with it because when it's related to the context that they're learning in the book, I think that that, that motivation to, to interact with the book and to learn increases. So those are my ideas. Hopefully, you know, I gave you some, some practical techniques you can use and, and kind of an overall approach to uh, being more successful so that our, it, with our IELTS listening tests and bringing them into the classroom because I think that by doing this we can help our students perform at the level that they should be because again um, for those of you who, who uh, may have missed the, the, the second slide or so you know I think that listening tests have a, a strong number of students who underperform and, and don't make the score that actually they should have have made. Um, and I think that this sort of purposeful practice, this sort of practice that makes perfect can really be used to help that. So that's my presentation. And now I think we have some time for questions. So I'll turn it over to my fantastic moderators. Thanks for listening. Thanks ever so much, Alan. That was a really interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, so we've got some questions that have come through already, but please keep typing your questions now. We've got about 15 minutes that we can spend on the question and answer. Um, so Alan, I'll go straight in with um, a 
couple of questions. So in your practice mode approach, you outline details for um, five plays of the audio. And we've had a couple of questions around that. So um, one of the questions was, um, how much time does this actually take in the classroom when you're going through five um, plays with different activities? And how often would you, would you do this um, activity in your classroom? I would tend to do it about once per course book unit because it does take time. And again, I would narrow down on one small part of the listening. And so like what you saw um, on, on the slide before that was at the museum, I think that was just about eight questions. And, and that as a listening uh, itself took about six minutes. And I would also, you know, when you're teaching IELTS listening with authentic practice tests, they, they give you that, you know, you now have some time to look at questions five to 10. I would only let them look at the questions once. We would go back and, and go immediately back into the playing. But I would never do it with a long, you know, 40 minute or 20 minute list because we just don't have the time in the class. But when I did this activity, bringing in it about, about once, like I said, once per unit, it became manageable. And um, I'd say it took about 25 to, to 30 minutes per class. I think what was crucial, though, uh, or what I found, is that it got students engaged in listening. It got students talking about why the answers were what they were. It got students talking about what they thought they heard and other things, and, and them collaborating together and learning from each other. So um, when I brought this into my private language school, I got a lot of pushback from teachers saying, we don't have time to do it. We don't have time to do it. But when they tried it um, just every so often, and they saw, you know, the results and they saw how, you know, the, the students would be more interactive. I think that they got bought into it. Now, again, it does take time. It's nothing you would do every lesson. And the, the, that's why I still gave that that CELTA approach with the course book style listening, because that's what I would do most often in classes would be using the listening from the course book. But in a book like like one of my favorites, Complete IELTS, I think that once per unit, just a short snippet uh, based on the context or something like if we're doing a map, especially and bringing in the part that's on the map, it works really well with that. Fantastic. Thanks, Alan. And uh, another question linked to that. Um, one of the participants asked um, or, or said that's a really great idea, but when would you start letting students listen just once to the audio, um, which replicates the IELTS test? I would, I mean, again, when I taught, you know, I was using about a 10 to 12 unit course book, depending on the class. And I like to bring in authentic practice testing about three times. Um, I, I, mainly because I did have them buy the, the, the IELTS book themselves. And I thought, you know, having four tests really gave us the chance to have one test as a complete exploration. And then I could use those other three practice tests that are in the book um, just at, at kind of third spots during the, the unit. I wouldn't want to do it too often because, again, I want them to feel that they're developing the skills. But I think over a given course, you know, three times of the actual test practice mode um, is is what I would do. And I'm not by any means saying that that's the right answer. I have no research. I mean, you know, there's very little research on bringing in uh, authentic practice tests as tests into the classroom that, that's substantial. But I think that was doable for me based on all the parameters that we have to deal with as teachers. Time as a factor, um, getting them exposure to the test. And, and, and that sort of thing. So for me, um, I would say about every third or fourth unit, we would actually do uh, something that was authentic and in that controlled testing type environment. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, a couple of other questions have come through. Um, can you, could you give us an example of an, a homework assignment that went over very well with your students for listening practice? I think um, when I would give listening practice homework, and again, this is a, a personal question, I, I would want them to actually make their own dialogues. I felt that having them perform in an IELTS class was unexpected. It was something that really went over well, um, and it gave them it gave them experience listening or having to create 
things um, based on intonation and experiences. Um, so a lot of my listening that I would have them do was actually them producing something that copied the type of listening that they thought they would be hearing. I found that to be uh, useful for homework. My students, and your students might be different, but my students had no problem going to the internet and finding you know, things from the British Council website for free things from you know, Australia Network, things even from Cambridge University Press's website sometimes that give them extra listening practice. And IELTS students, where I'm from, you know, tend to be pretty keen to do that. So I never just really wanted to do listening homework as listening because I found my students were doing that themselves and being autonomous about mm -hmm. it. So I wanted to, to make something a little different in my approach. So, you know, things that went on, like I, I gave with those distractors, um, sending the distractor dialogue home for them to come and maybe start out the class with it the next day would be something that I would do. And you might say, isn't that a speaking activity? Well, a little bit, but it hits those skills and it hits the things that they need to be listening for, those discourse points on the listening exam. Great, thank you. Um, something else that has come through, um, accessing listening activities. Do you have any, any ideas for where the, our teachers can find some listening activities in, to use in the classroom? Um, I think this is once again a, a, a good point to, to to bring in test bank as as you know just the authentic sort of listening activities. Um, a, another thing that I would say to IELTS teachers is do not be afraid to use supplements from general English. Um, there's a book called Listening Extra by Miles Craven, and um, I think it's a CUP book as well. It's a photocopyable book. It is fantastic, especially for low levels learners at building in the listening skills at the type of things that, that we need to, to be giving students in those IELTS type uh, environments. You know, there's lecture type things, there's blank, there's, there's dialogue recordings. Um, if you really want something that's photocopyable and easy to use that you can have a long time, um, in addition to the course book and authentic practice, listening extra by Miles Craven. Also, Instant IELTS uh, doesn't get as much credit as it should for our photocopyables, um, you know, which is, is another thing from Cambridge. And I'm, I'm not just saying this because I, I work for mm -hmm. Cambridge, but these are truly the best out there. But don't be afraid to bring in something from general English. It's not because, ooh, there's IELTS listening as opposed to general, you know, the, the, the same set of skills and the same set of focus applies. But if, if there's one thing that you need to get, it's listening extra. Fantastic, thank you. Um, now, you, you have mentioned Test Bank a couple of times, and uh, we've had a question um, for more kind of detail about how you could integrate Test Bank into the class. Mm. Well, I think that again, you know, the Test Bank is, is integrated by, by mostly being asynchronous, and, and it, this is, really that idea to get in, you know, true blended learning. I mean, to get them the idea of, of where outside of the class, and like we said, for that homework um, sort of option, to have them take the test, even in the practice mode, have them look, and then the, the class is, you, you have more time to talk about why the answers were what they were, and to really go in depth and, and decode, not just their answers, but the listening script itself. When you open up listening beyond just the answers that go in the blank, I found that students have a lot of real relevant questions about English and understanding that come out of it. And I think that that's what Test Bank really does. It, it frees up the time in class for that feedback part of listening, for that, that understanding and that reflective part of listening because so much of becoming a good listener is really assessing what what your strengths and weaknesses and where you need to focus on next and i think that that is that's where test bank really helps it's not that you would do the tests together in class um, with test bank i think that you know if you're going to do that it's it's better to have the collaboration and the, the activities like i said but what test bank mm -hmm. does is it frees up that time Brilliant. Okay, another question coming in. Um, 
In your Create Your Own Dialogues assignment, did you have the students record themselves or write up their own script to perform in class? How, how, how did that work? When I did it, I had them write their own scripts and they performed it in class and then the class themselves would have to kind of, you know, guess what the answer was. So, so they would say something like, I'm, you know, I was going to go yesterday, but I couldn't, so I'm going to go tomorrow. And then, you know, the, the other person say, when am I going to go? And then the class and teams would kind of make it a game and see who said yesterday and who said tomorrow. And it was interesting to see what the students created uh, to, you know, try to trick their fellow students. And it was even interesting sometimes when they thought they were writing something that was a distractor and it was pretty straightforward itself, um, which happens and, and, you know, what can you do? But um, I, I think that, when I did it, I did it live. I, I, I like drama techniques in a classroom. I'm a big fan of Alan Maley and bringing in that sort of thing, even in IELTS classes. However, I like the idea of recording it, especially in these days of YouTube. I mean, I don't, if, if I were if I were still teaching in classes regularly, I think the first thing I'd do is set up a class YouTube page every time, because that really gives a chance for us to look and and and, and have students, especially with speaking and listening, practice and present and and, and review. So I, 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 I would say, please try it and record it and, and, and let us know how it goes. Um, but it's just something, again, that focuses them on that part of the test that we assume, we assume students understand that those distractors are there and that they're tricky. And I think, you know, we can make too many assumptions as teachers sometimes about what our students do and don't know about a test. So it's just about that focusing and highlighting that that happens in the test. Great. That's really interesting. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more question. Um, and someone has said here, you know, really useful tips. And obviously, you're talking about in the classroom. But is there any way that this, um, your advice can be adapted for someone who's um, wanting to improve their listening skills um, on their own? I mean, there's there's definite things to take from this. If you're if you're trying to improve listening skills on your own, make sure that you're not just thinking that your listening skill is improving from a score. Um, oh, I got five right yesterday, and I got six right today. Therefore, I'm I've improved. So I think what what you can take from this is you know what what I try to tell teachers to do in the classroom with both of those types of activities. The the, the one where we listen five times and the CELTA one, is that there is a reflection and there is a going back and don't be afraid of using the audio script. You know, that that's key. Um, you know, the, the reflection of what we do after we've listened and after we filled in the blank, that's something that I think learners on their own need to be able to do. Not just read and go, oh, that's the, the right answer, but reflect, why is that the right answer? And where was I tricked? Why didn't I hear it? And be able to focus. Having said that, my webinars really are about, you know, bringing this into the classroom and, and trying to show you guys how, you know, practice tests can be collaborative and can be used as a whole. So that's why they focus on, on that part. But I do think that those key elements, more of the approach than technique, can be absorbed and, and, and utilized by learners for themselves as well. You know, it doesn't stop at just checking whether you're right or not. There's more of the process of listening development that goes on after that. Great. Well, thank you, um, Alan. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. We've had some really positive comments in the chat box. Thank you ever so much um, for joining us today. Um, and you're all asking for more webinars um, on IELTS. And we um, there's some information there in the chat box about previous uh, webinars and an upcoming webinar. So please do join us. Uh, don't forget to check our events page for details of all of our upcoming webinars. Uh, you can visit that at cambridge.org slash ELT events. Um, and the recording of today's webinar should be live on our blog and YouTube channel next week. And please don't forget to download your certificate from the link that you can see on the screen now. So thanks again, Alan. That was a very interesting webinar. And have a great day, everyone. Thank you and bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.